England, 1888. Hundreds of large-scale manufacturing plants had opened during this period of tremendous industrial growth. And many women served as unskilled laborers, working in terrible conditions for very little money. The trade unions of the day weren't interested in the plight of these unskilled workers. Conditions at the Bryant and May match factory were particularly appalling, where women worked as many as 14 hours a day, suffering from exposure to toxic chemicals. But as miserable as many of them were, none openly protested. Then, one day, an unassuming woman in proper dress with swept-back hair walked in. Her name was Annie Besant. In Victorian England, she was known as Red Annie. I mean, she was there on the barricades. She was passionate for the rights of women. She was passionate about labor conditions. She was passionate about child labor. Besson's involvement with the Match Girls produced a three-week strike that forever changed the labor movement in England. Never before had unskilled workers organized a strike against management. For many, this success would have marked a pinnacle of their career. For Annie Besant, it was just one step in a lifelong quest that took her from the factory floor to the temples of India and into the depths of religious mysticism. Her deepest convictions related to uh, making a difference in the world. She felt that it was her highest calling to be of service to humanity. She always was someone who carved her own course and very much created her own destiny. Her sense of compassion was strong. During her long career as an activist, social reformer, and religious nonconformist, Annie Besant sacrificed her family, risked her reputation, and even lost her freedom. She was motivated by a desire for spiritual fulfillment, a quest that compelled her to reinvent herself in both rewarding and surprising ways. Life for middle-class Victorian women in the late 1800s was bound by rigid formality and limited possibility. For the young Annie Wood, those constraints felt like a straitjacket. She'd had a hard time accepting the status quo, even as a girl. And Annie had grown into a self-reliant and independent young woman. In that age, girls were trained to be pleasing, learn to play the piano, but not too well, speak French, but not philosophically, uh, do a little bit of painting, just so that they were pleasing to the men around them. They could uh, enhance their homes with social graces. Well, Besson's education was not that at all. Reading on her own in a friend's library, Annie was a self-made intellectual. She loved the classics and history, and she was particularly drawn to theology and religious ritual. She saw religion as a path to help end the world's suffering. She could be a minister herself, that was not allowed for women. And so she took uh, then the best choice she could, which was a disastrous choice. She married a clergyman. The Reverend Frank Besant, seven years her senior, was as methodical and austere as his new bride was impulsive and exuberant. Within the first week of the marriage, it was clear as a disaster. She had thought it would be a great avenue to serve God. She quickly found that it was an avenue to serve tea, which is not what she wanted. I don't think her husband understood her intellectual interests at all. I can imagine him coming home in the afternoon and finding Annie Besant that she's been reading all day and she hasn't done the dishes or cleaned the house and he's angry, you know, why aren't you being a proper wife? In fact, Frank Besant was a bad-tempered man. Frustrated with his strong-willed wife, he at times struck her, even while she was pregnant. For four years, Annie struggled against depression and tried to be a proper wife and mother. But a family illness served as a turning point and brought about a crisis of faith. Her baby daughter Mabel came down with whooping cough, a deadly illness. And all she could do is hold the baby. She starts asking herself the question, well, why would a God, the Christian God, who is all-powerful, uh, and who is all loving and all good, why would a God like that let a little baby suffer like this? And uh, fortunately her daughter got well 
but it really started her theological questioning. The more Besant examined church dogma, the greater her doubts became. For Besant, the church she had so loved as a young girl now seemed only a source of hypocrisy, an empty ritual. She had lost her faith. I do not believe in God. My mind finds no grounds on which to build up a reasonable faith. My conscience rebels against the injustice, the cruelty, the inequality which surround me on every side. She felt that she was no longer a Christian. She could not take communion. Now, of course, her husband was an Anglican priest. She's sitting there on the front row as a clergyman's wife. Then, time for communion, and she dramatically stands up and walks out and embarrasses him, and um, he then gives her an ultimatum. Say, you conform or you leave. For a woman to abandon her husband in Victorian England was unthinkable. But despite the difficulties this choice presented, Besant's strong convictions left her with no alternative. At that period, uh, a woman belonged to her husband, <laughs> and uh, she had no property of her own, could, could own no property of her own, even. In 1873, at the age of 26, Annie Besant moved to London and left her son Digby with her husband. Everything was arranged. I found myself guardian of my little daughter and possessor of a small monthly income sufficient for respectable starvation. I think of all the things she did, this is the point at which she showed her greatest courage. This is what now demarcates her from most Victorian women, some of whom were in unhappy marriages, who simply suffered and found other avenues or managed to cope. Besant was not one to cope, she was one to rebel. London in the late 19th century had become a mecca for those, like Annie Besant, who rejected the status quo. They condemned materialism, they opposed the expanding British colonial empire, and they supported women's rights. They were the radicals and intellectuals of their day, and it didn't take long for Besant to find her place among them. Educated and eloquent, Besant quickly became a popular lecturer and writer. Here you have a woman who, horror of horrors, is an atheist, but also speaking in public. People used to throw things at her in her lectures. Many women are driven into bitterness because their ambition is thwarted at every step. In their eager longing for a fuller life, they are forced back and crushed. She found herself intoxicated by the excitement of standing before a crowd. Everyone, even people who later couldn't stand her, always acknowledged that her oratory was quite extraordinary. She could weave a spell over an audience. And one could make a living at that in late Victorian England. Unlike many other reformers of the day, Besant did not curb her tactics to appeal to so-called decent society. Instead, she took a step in the opposite direction. She spoke out on the most taboo subject of all, birth control. In Victorian England in the 1870s, it was uh, against the law to speak or publish anything related to birth control. It was considered obscene. Besant knew full well how inflammatory the subject was. She'd been warned that she was risking both arrest and the custody of her daughter Mabel. But she decided that drawing attention to this issue was worth the risk. In 1877, Besant and a colleague distributed a booklet promoting female contraception. In it, they argued that with more mouths to feed, the poor were less likely to improve their standard of living. We think it more moral to prevent conception of children than, after they are born, to murder them by want of food, air, and clothing. She avoided a prison sentence, but Besant's extremist colleagues felt that she had gone too far. This confirmed in the minds of many that Besant was someone you don't want to be associated with, that uh, she is too radical, but also too immoral. Besant's estranged husband agreed. He used the pamphlet as evidence that Besant was an unfit mother who promoted what was termed indecent and obscene material. After a highly publicized custody hearing, the court ruled in her husband's favor. Besant now resigned herself to the loss of both of her young children. 
Ironically, in an attempt to aid poor families, she had lost her own. Now left with only her passion and ambition, Besant turned her attention to the plight of young women working in London's newly built factories. Dangerously overcrowded and poorly ventilated, many women lost limbs and their lives to these machines. At the Bryant and May Match Factory, the chemicals used were deadly, and many employees grew sick and died from bone cancer. Who cares for the fate of these white wage slaves? born in slums, driven to work while still children. Who cares if they die or go on the streets, provided only that the Bryant and May shareholders get their 23 percent. Besant's outrage led her to action. In 1888, she helped organize these young women in a strike against Bryant and May. And after three weeks of picketing, the company gave in to Besant's demands. The work week was shortened, their pay was increased, and working conditions were greatly improved. The success of the strike did dramatically strengthen Besson's reputation. Those who loved her became all the more devoted to her. Those who felt that she was, um, you know, Satan incarnate now were confirmed in their belief because she was seen as destroying the fiber of, uh, of English society. At 42, Annie Besant had found success helping to unionize unskilled workers, igniting open discussion on the subject of birth control, and drawing attention to the cause of women's rights. But Besant saw that, essentially, society remained unchanged. Ultimately, she wanted to address the root of all human suffering, and she needed a more transcendent path, one that fulfilled the needs of the soul as well as the body. Annie Besant didn't know that her search was about to come to an end. To an unlikely rebel came an unlikely prophet. Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky was a Russian aristocrat who abandoned her husband, smoked cigars, and cursed openly. Like Annie Besant, Madame Blavatsky was a woman of extremes. People either really loved her because there was something very endearing about her or they hated her because uh, she could also be very abrupt and and uh, fierce. Madame Blavatsky was more than just a maverick. She was really a threat, I believe, in a lot of ways. She was challenging the orthodoxy of certain Christian traditions, though she had a lot of people very upset. While in New York in 1875, Blavatsky and an American colleague, Henry Olcott, founded a spiritual organization that promoted universal brotherhood. They believed that all religions, philosophies, and even science could serve as paths towards truth. They called it the Theosophical Society, meaning the divine wisdom of God. Theosophy does provide a method by which different religions can be understood in a respectful manner, can be appreciated for what it is that they have to offer. So it draws heavily on Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Taoism, Gnosticism, Christianity. All of this is in there and it takes them all very seriously no matter what the culture. Theosophists believe that all humanity is one family. We're a brotherhood. But beyond that, if there is but one source of life, if there is one life everywhere in the universe, then that life is precious. And to destroy any part of it is to destroy ourselves. You know the famous words of the poet John Donne, no man is an island, each one is a part of the continent. We're all part of each other. Theosophy does say that the religion that holds the special truths is Hinduism. And Theosophy incorporates as part of its core doctrines the belief in reincarnation and the belief in karma, that our actions to today create our own destiny and our actions today will determine how we are reincarnated. Blavatsky condensed her theories into a book she called The Secret Doctrine. And when it was published, it was given to Besant for review. Her radical colleagues assumed that she would disparage the book. Instead, it overwhelmed her. I was dazzled. 
blinded by the light in which disjointed facts were seen as parts of a mighty whole, and all my puzzles, riddles, problems seemed to disappear. I knew that the weary search was over, and the very truth was found. I think that she found those answers to the questions that she was asking about what really is the source of suffering and what really is the path out of suffering beyond just addressing the physical needs of people. To the shock of her friends, Besant eagerly sought out a meeting with Madame Blavatsky. When Besant met her, she got caught up in the, sort of the R of Blavatsky and fell at her feet. She said she felt like a wild animal that has now been tamed. Once again, Annie Besant reinvented herself. She retreated from her commitments, drifted away from her activist colleagues, and devoted herself to theosophy. Having spent 15 years dedicated to improving the working and living conditions of the poor in England, Besant now abandoned this cause, and in 1894, she moved to India. In her idealized image of the East, Besant believed she had found a culture that stressed spiritual growth rather than material gain. India is the mother of religion. In her are combined science and religion in perfect harmony, and that is the Hindu religion. And it is India that shall be again the spiritual mother of the world. She spoke about India in a way that almost sounded like she had been there earlier and she did come to believe that she had actually been Indian in earlier lives and it was a bad karma made her British and that in later lives she would be reborn as an Indian uh, because of her good works on, in, the, in this world. But for her, India was the other, completely different from Britain. Besant's skills as both orator and organizer drew thousands of new members to Theosophy. Every year, spiritual adventurers from around the world flocked to hear Besant's message. It is said that wherever she traveled, she spoke without a note, and she could grasp people. She could really take hold of people. There was a passion in her. But in Besant's calling as a theosophist, she didn't totally abandon her activist roots. In particular, her passion for India carried over to the welfare of its people. During India's prolonged fight for independence from Britain, Besant became one of the few English champions for Indian home rule. As a result, she once again paid a high price for her beliefs. The British government jailed Besant for over three months. She was a woman who had to have a cause, I think. And that cause of Indian independence, she had a wonderful vision for it. I think she felt that that India must reclaim its proper place in the whole family of nations. This made her extraordinarily popular with Indian nationalists. Here she was, a white British woman, but now she becomes Mother Besant and truly the representative of Indian nationalism. In the early 20th century, tensions were mounting between the nations of Europe. The world appeared headed in a dangerous direction, towards war. And in times of great anxiety, spiritual communities often search for deliverance. In 1908, a rumor began to spread among theosophists. A powerful spiritual messenger was coming. It had been foretold that there would be a new world teacher, a new messiah, some person who would lead the world out of darkness. This was in the lineage and the tradition of the Christ, the Buddha, Krishna, uh, Muhammad, great religious teachers who come at a time of darkness, who are able to help people through a Deepen, deepen sense of what is important in life. One afternoon in 1909 on a beach near Madras, India, a colleague of Besant's, Charles Leadbeater, spotted a group of young boys. It was believed that Leadbeater was clairvoyant, that he was capable of reading a person's spiritual energy. And there was one boy who stood out from the rest. He saw in this young boy on the uh, Bay of Bengal something that was very different from others. 
he saw a child with an aura that was very beautiful and as he said later had no hint of selfishness Although he was malnourished and weakened from malaria, Theosophus jubilantly anointed this unlikely 14-year-old the next messiah. His name was Jiddu Krishnamurti. Despite skepticism among Theosophists, Annie Besant believed in Krishnamurti and took over his care and education. She moved him into the Theosophical headquarters, and in an effort to retain control over the boy, Besant went a step further she legally adopted Krishnamurti. She trained him in his role as a world teacher. Interestingly, her training incorporated that he would have spiritual development, but she also wanted him to be trained as a proper English gentleman. She wanted him to go to Oxford, because how could the world teacher actually not go to Oxford? She wanted him to learn to eat with utensils. She wanted him to dress more in Western clothes. For 10 years, Annie Besant groomed Krishnamurti. Finally, in 1921, she decided it was time for him to assume his rightful place. People throughout the world are seeking comfort, but not understanding. Krishnamurti had grown into a capable, handsome, and charismatic young man. And like his adoptive mother, he spoke forcefully, simply, and passionately. Donations to the Theosophical Society flooded in, and the world press couldn't resist covering this unusual story. The expectation of a messiah always generates that excitement historically. Uh, it's actually a good way to attract people to a new movement. I'm not purporting that Annie Besant did this as a PR thing. I'm, I don't mean to imply that at all. But it would have had the effect of attracting more people to the, um, to the Theosophical Society. In private, Annie Besant looked after Krishnamurti as her adopted son. In public, as his devoted disciple, she was dedicated to him as her spiritual teacher. I, who have known him from his childhood, who have watched his growth, see the manhood raised into divinity, offer myself to him as disciple, rejoicing to know that I can continue to serve in reverent devotion. But as Krishnamurti matured, the bond between them was severely tested. He had grown uncomfortable with his role in the movement and felt he had become merely an icon placed on a pedestal. Just as Annie Besant had, as a young woman, rejected the role expected of her, Krishnamurti now rejected his. Organizations cannot make you free or develop the inner man. No man from outside can make you free. In 1929, to the surprise of everyone, Krishnamurti declared his intention to separate himself from theosophy and go off on his own. Thousands of theosophists who had come to depend on Krishnamurti's spiritual guidance were left on their own and devastated. For Annie Besant, the news was stunning. In private, she was shattered and confused. In public, Besant remained stoic and maintained her faith in Krishnamurti's divine wisdom. I'm told by someone who was present uh, that her immediate reaction was, but you're my teacher, I will follow you. And he said, no, you, you must stay with the society. You're the president. You, leave. you do not leave. Annie Besant listened and she disagreed with him on a few points. But she also said that uh, he now was her spiritual superior and that when he was teaching something that she didn't understand, she would just sort of hold that and hope to grow into understanding at a later point. But she certainly considered him to be the world teacher uh, for the rest of her life until her death. Journeying from vicar's wife to spiritual leader, Annie Besant lived courageously and passionately. She brought attention to the working conditions of the poor, and she spoke out on such radical issues as birth control, Indian nationalism, and the brotherhood of man. The common thread was her compulsion to end the world's suffering and to seek spiritual enlightenment. She actually wanted to change the world. I mean, she wanted to change society. 
She looked around and saw that a lot of people suffered. There's a lot of injustice, the powerful dominate the weak, and she wanted to alleviate that suffering. Bess's greatest strength was her absolute courage. She was ready to defy authority and take the consequences, but she had the courage of her convictions. In 1933, at the age of 85, Annie Besant died at the Theosophical Headquarters in India. She asked that her grave be marked with the epitaph, she tried to follow the truth. I would say to those of you who are young today, look forward to a future full of nobler tasks that you may do, that we have left undone. Never forget that life can only be nobly inspired and rightly lived if you take it bravely and gallantly as a splendid adventure.